Good morning, church. Welcome to worship and our time together. And as John mentioned earlier, we hope you'll take note of all the news that's in the bulletin. Uh, there are a lot of things happening and a lot of things that are scheduled to begin with the coming uh, fall season. Uh, but it starts with a busy August, and we hope that you'll take note of all the things there. There is something that starts next week, so I'm going to do a quick public service announcement here just to let you know that next Sunday I'll begin a new message series. It's going to be from the Gospel of Mark, the first eight chapters of Mark, which are devoted as a unit to helping us to understand who Jesus is and what it means to follow him. So the next message series is entitled, Hashtag Jesus. If you know your social media, when you hit a little hashtag, or when I grew up, it was what you used to play tic-tac-doe, I don't know. But if you see that, you know that on social media, you use that little hashtag sign to follow people on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram, whatever the case may be. So our next sermon series is about Jesus. Who do we say that he is? And what does it mean to follow him? And we'll be looking through those first eight chapters of the Gospel of Mark if you want to read ahead. I want to invite you to not only be a part of that series, but invite friends, family, relatives, co-workers, people who you know who maybe have expressed to you at some point an interest in the Christian faith, but perhaps are uncertain about it. Maybe you know someone who said, well, you know, I might be interested in coming to church, but you know, so much of that church stuff just goes over my head. Or there's so much stuff I don't know, I would be embarrassed to show up, and, and I, I, I just don't understand. Or maybe it's not even about church attendance. Maybe it's someone who's, who wants to know more about the Bible or more about the faith, but they don't know how to go about asking about it or, or how to go about having a conversation. This is a good series to invite them because we're going to be talking about the basic, the basic reality of the Christian faith, which is Jesus. Jesus is what everything's based on. So this is a great sermon series, message series for you to invite folks, and I want you to do that. I was talking to uh, Gary and Pam Schroyer uh, some time ago and was talking about my preaching philosophy, and I'll share it with you. Um, preaching is like flying an airplane. My dad should appreciate that. He was in the Air Force. Preaching is like flying an airplane, okay? One wing of the plane is evangelism. It's inviting people to, to accept Jesus Christ as the Son of God and Savior in faith and begin a new life for here and for eternity in Him. That's evangelism. The other wing of the plane is discipleship. It's taking new or young Christians and helping them grow in their faith, grow in their knowledge of the Word, and grow in their ability to apply, apply God's Word into the world, and, and grow up into maturity, what we call in the Wesleyan tradition, sanctification. So what I try to do is I try to fly the airplane of preaching by keeping both wings in play. If you know anything about flying an airplane, if you always fly with, a, with an emphasis to the left, you start going in circles. You just fly in circles. You never go forward. If you start tilting to the right and constantly emphasizing that, you start going in circles. The way to keep the plane going forward is to keep both wings in play. So sometimes I'll preach a sermon series that's going to be based on discipleship, sometimes on evangelism, on reaching new people. But I'll let you know ahead of time what these sermons are about. And that way you'll know how to participate and hopefully how to invite and how to engage. But this next series is an evangelism one. There's no question about it. It's talking about Jesus, the fundamental reality of our faith. And I want to encourage you to invite folks and be a part of that. It'll start in August. It'll continue through uh, September. Uh, and I'll have something on Wednesday night associated with that, but that can wait till next week. So there's your public service announcement for this morning. And speaking of Jesus, we want to encounter him in the Bible. So if you have your Bibles, you may want to turn with me to our scripture this morning. It's Matthew chapter 22, beginning in verse 15, continuing through verse 22. I'll be reading 
from the English Standard Version. If you have your Bibles, you can read along. If you have your Bible on your phone, you can read along, or you can read on the screen behind me. I invite you to stand for the reading of God's Word. Hear now the word of the Lord. Then the Pharisees went and plotted how to entangle him in his words. We're talking about Jesus. And they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians saying, Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God truthfully. And you do not care about anyone's opinion for you are not swayed by appearances. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. And Jesus said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? They said, Caesar's. Then he said to them, "Render, Therefore render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard it, they marveled, and they left him. And went away. And brothers and sisters, this is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Lord God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts together be acceptable and pleasing in your sight. For you alone are our strength and our redeemer. And this we ask in the name of the word made flesh, Christ our Lord. Amen. And you may be seated. Now, I heard a story once from a preacher who said he heard it from a pastor, who heard it from another pastor. That means this story is either a piece of long-standing holy gossip or has been somewhere along the line completely made up. But I'll share this story with you anyway in the hope that it gets the point across. The story is told of a pastor who found himself in need of a new secretary in the church office. The previous secretary had retired after a long tenure. And so the pastor put out a a help wanted ad and some responses came in. The pastor set up interviews for one Friday when there wasn't a lot going on in the church office. He asked one of the board members to join him in the interviews, and he and the board member interviewed various candidates for the secretarial position this Friday afternoon. At the end of the day, they talked it over. They'd only had one candidate that hadn't shown up, but they thought they had some good candidates. They had someone in mind already, and they agreed to pray about it and get together again after service on Sunday to talk about it. The board member left. The pastor went back into his office to get some things together and as the pastor was locking the church up a young lady drove into the church lot at a rather rapid speed and pace got out of the car and said pastor I'm so sorry I was supposed to be here for an interview earlier today and my car broke down please 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 is there some way that I can still have an interview Well, it was already late on this Friday, and everyone has gone home, including the other board member. The pastor was the only one there. And frankly, this is a a young, attractive woman, and the pastor kind of had a rule about not wanting to be in compromising situations. But he felt badly for this young lady. He said, I'll tell you what, let's just go in the office door here and just sit right here at the door with the door open, and we'll just have a quick interview. And so they did. And she thanked him, and she went back out to his car, and again, as he got ready to lock up the door, she realized, he realized that she, the young lady, was having trouble once again with her car. Again, it wouldn't start. So the young lady came back over and said, Pastor, I am so sorry to bother you, but this is the second time my car is broken down. I need to call the tow, tow company and the mechanic who worked on it earlier today. They're not in. I'm so sorry. Can you give me a ride home? Now, this made the pastor quite uncomfortable because, you see, the pastor served in a small town where everybody knew everybody, and he was concerned that if he were seen on a Friday evening driving around with a a woman quite younger than him and quite attractive in his car, that it might make the rounds, if you know what I mean. 
But he realized he needed to help this young lady, so he did give her a ride home. It was five minutes, but to him it felt like 50. Because he was sure every eye in town was on him. Then he went home. He had scheduled a date night with his wife. They were going out to eat at her favorite restaurant. She said, well, you're running behind. What happened? And he didn't know how to explain the story, and he really didn't want to have to go into the fact that he had been driving this young lady around. He said, well, I'll tell you later. We're already running late. Just get in the car, and we'll go to the restaurant and eat. As he was driving his car with his wife in the passenger side, as he was driving to their favorite restaurant, he happened to glance over and he noticed in the floorboard of the passenger side of the car, beneath his wife's feet, a lady's high heel shoe. Now, if this pastor had been true to his calling, and frankly, if he'd had any sense in his head, he would have explained to his wife right then and there what was going on. But he panicked. Pastors are human, and he panicked. He pulled the car over to the side of the road. He said, honey, I think I've got a tire going flat. I think it's the passenger side rear tire. Will you get out and check it? And she said, I thought in the car if the tire was going down, a light would come on. He said, well, that's my problem. I don't see a light, but I hear something going on. I need to stay in the car and look at that light. Go back there and just look at the tire and maybe kick it or something. And she's looking at him like he's crazy. He's never asked that before. But she gets out, goes back, looks at the tire, kicks it around. While she does that, Pastor reaches down, gets that high heel shoe, zips his window down, throws that shoe out the window. <laughs> Honey, I think it's okay. You can get back in the car. His wife gets back in the car. She's still looking at him like, you know, that, that didn't make a bit, bit of sense. He said, no, I think it's okay. I think, I think it's okay. I, the light came on. I think everything's okay. They went on to the restaurant. He got out of the car. He went around. He's a gentleman. He went around to open the door for his wife. Reached out his hand. His wife looked up at him with a look that only wives can give to a husband. And fear went through his mind and his heart. And he said, what's wrong? And she said, I can't find one of my shoes. <laughs> now you see, that pastor made an assumption. And brothers and sisters, let me tell you, assumptions will kill you every time. When you are in a circumstance or a situation which at first glance seems to call for a particular answer or response, oftentimes you think about that answer or response based on an assumption you're making. You're assuming you know all the facts. You're assuming you know what's really going on. And you can act on that assumption and get yourself in real trouble. So we should never assume anything in life. We should never act on our first assumptions. But rather, we should cautiously step back and assess a situation and look at it before we make a hurried and incorrect response. Now what's true in life is also true in the study of Scripture. Because in the passage of Scripture that I shared with you this day, oftentimes people jump to an assumption about what Jesus does. Now, this particular Scripture is, is prominent in the Gospel. It's in more than one Gospel, and it's certainly been preached on a lot through the years, and I know that it's been preached on even here. And it's familiar to us. But so many times when we encounter this story, we tend to make an assumption. We look at Jesus dealing with the Pharisees and the Herodians, and we see how they seek to trap him, and he gets out of the trap. And that's what we see. We see that and we say, man, Jesus got out of that trap. Did you see him there? They had him, they had him where they thought they wanted him. And Jesus turned the tables on him and got out of that trap and got out of answering the question and got away. Now we can think that's what happened. We can assume that's what happened. And I will tell you there are a lot of people who make that assumption when they get into this scripture. In fact, even some commentators 
I've even read some commentators who have written Sunday school material who have made that assumption. Oh, Jesus got out of answering the question. I'm here to tell you that's not true. Jesus was asked a political question and gave a direct answer. He did not avoid it or evade it, but he used it. He used it. In this particular scripture, Jesus is teaching in the week leading up to his crucifixion. This is Holy Week as we know it. He's days away from going to the cross, but yet he is still pouring himself out in his teaching and preaching to his disciples and to those who would listen to him in Jerusalem among the crowds gathered there for the festival. And as Jesus is teaching and preaching and drawing these crowds, those that are opposed to Jesus feel threatened by him. And that's the interesting thing. Jesus threatened both political parties of his day. There were two political parties in Jesus' day. You may know that already. The Pharisees and the Herodians. Now, they would tell you that they were religious groups or religious institutions. But in fact, they were political. The Pharisees politically couldn't stand the Romans. And the Romans, of course, ruled the known world. So that means the Romans ruled Jerusalem and the land around Jerusalem. And the Pharisees didn't want to be ruled by the Romans because the Roman government had declared Caesar, the head of Rome and the Roman government, that they had declared Caesar a god. And the Pharisees, being good Jewish leaders and scholars, believed that it was wrong for the Jewish people, God's people, to acknowledge anyone as being a God except the true God. So they couldn't stand the Romans, and they didn't believe in cooperating with the Romans at all. If there was any way to, to not cooperate with them, that's what the Pharisees wanted to do. And the Pharisees were opposed to paying taxes to Caesar. Why? Because the government declared Caesar a God, and if you're giving money to someone who's been declared a God, that's a form of idolatry. At least that's what they thought. So the Pharisees argued that the Jewish people should not pay taxes to the Roman government. In other words, pay taxes to Caesar. The Pharisees encouraged people, frankly, to get out of it by not having any money at all. Just be poor and destitute, and that way you don't owe any money to anybody. The Pharisees are pretty unrealistic about that, and the scriptures are pretty silent about how the Pharisees got away with not being arrested for treason. Undoubtedly, they didn't necessarily practice what they preached. But that was their argument. Good Jews should not pay taxes to Caesar. Then you had the Herodians. These were the Jewish people who were the pragmatists. They were practical people. They said, are you kidding me? Rome has come in. They've given us a stable government, a stable economy. We've got good roads to travel on. We can trade with other nations. None of these warring tribes that used to always attack us are attacking us now. You know, they brought peace and prosperity. Hey, Rome's a good thing. So Caesar says he's a god. So the, Ro so the Roman government says he's a god. Big deal. Let's pay the taxes. Roman government is good for us. It's good for our wallets. It's good for life in general. The Herodians, of course, were called that because they supported the family of Herod. And the family of Herod was the family that Rome put on the throne in that area. Remember Herod the Great when Jesus was born. So they took their name as the Herodians. So you had the Pharisees on one side and the Herodians on the other, and they argued and bickered constantly, and each called the other the ruination of society. And they couldn't agree on anything except one thing. They both had been criticized by Jesus, and they both saw Jesus as a threat. Jesus actually got, indirectly, not by his own doing, but because of who he was, and because of what he said, and because of what he did, and because of where he stood, Jesus actually got the Pharisees and the Herodians to get together and do something. 
about like getting the Democrats and Republicans together to do anything today. You know? I'm not getting political here, and I don't preach politics. I'll just tell you that right up front. But I will tell you that the two political parties are farther apart than they've ever been, I think, since probably the 18th century. I mean, the, the, excuse me, the 19th century, when the 1800s, when the Civil War took place. They are so far apart. Can you imagine one person making the Democrats and Republicans in Washington come together and say, oh, can we please work together? Please, please, please. Jesus had that effect on the Pharisees and Herodians. They said, let's get rid of this guy. He's a threat to both of us. So they decided to pose that political question to Jesus in public where everybody could hear his answer. Oh, Jesus, you're such a wonderful teacher. You're so knowledgeable. We respect you so. Not. But we respect you so. Tell us, oh, please tell us, is it, is it lawful for us to pay, pay taxes to Caesar or not? And Jesus knew exactly what was going on. He wasn't being asked a question for the sake of yielding an answer. He was being asked a question so that in one way, shape, or form, somebody was going to walk away from him in the crowd opposed to him. The way the crowds were being drawn to him amazed his opponents. And they wanted to somehow get those crowds down to manageable sizes. To get people to turn their back on Jesus so they could come after him. So they said, we've got him. Either way he answers this, someone's going to be upset. If he says, pay the tax, then half the people are going to be mad at him because they're saying all he wants to support Rome. If he says, don't pay the tax, the Herodians are going straight to the authorities and having them arrest him for treason. So they thought they had Jesus trapped. Jesus... In responding to this, let them know that he knew what they were trying to do. The scripture says that he was aware of their malice and said, Why put me to the test, you hypocrites? And then he asked to see a coin. The coin for the tax. The coin for the tax. Now, on the screen behind me is a denarius. It's a Roman denarius. Rome minted it. Rome put it into circulation. Rome wanted the countries and the cultures that they ruled over, that they had conquered. Rome wanted people to use Roman money. And so Rome said, when it comes time to pay your taxes, you have to pay your taxes in Roman coin, in Roman currency. And this was a denarius. So you see, all the people, the cultures, the nations that Rome ruled had to use Roman coins. They were given Roman coins by Caesar, by the government, to use, to buy, and to sell. They would trade their money in. They would get the Roman coins. They would use it. It was much easier to buy and sell with Roman money. And then when it came time to pay the tax, the tax was to be paid in Roman money. Now, Romans were no fools. Rome knew that the more people that used their coins then the more control they had over the economies of the world. And they wanted complete control. So they encouraged people to use Roman coins, Roman currency. And on the currency is a picture of Caesar, the head of the Roman government. Caesar's image and likeness and Caesar's inscription, his name, his mark, if you will. The way people identified what belonged to them. Caesar's inscription, Caesar's mark. Caesar's image. So Jesus says, well, bring me a coin that you use to pay the tax. And they brought him a Roman coin. That's what they would use. And when they brought him the denarius, Jesus said, whose likeness and inscription is on it? And they said, well, Caesar's. Then he said to them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. In other words, Jesus answered the question. He gave a political answer to a political question. He said, pay the tax. And he explained why. He said, the tax that you're paying, 
you are called to pay in a, with a Roman coin. And you know something? That Roman coin doesn't belong to you. It belongs to Caesar. Caesar made it. Caesar minted it. Caesar put it into circulation. Caesar gave it to you in exchange for your local coin so that you could buy and sell and engage with trade. Caesar gave you that coin. Caesar made that coin. Caesar put his likeness on it. Caesar put his inscription on it. That coin belongs to Caesar by the law and tradition that was in, in place in that day in every culture. It belongs to Caesar. So if it belongs to Caesar and he wants it back, give it to him. Jesus answered a political question with a political answer with a logic that is beyond reach of most politicians today. We assume falsely if we think somehow Jesus wiggled out. If he got out of the situation, if he was slippery enough to escape that. No, we do not serve a risen Savior who escapes, who evades, who wiggles his way out of situations. We have a Savior and Lord who addresses questions, who addresses problems, who will stand up and say what is right and uses an opportunity to proclaim the good news. And that's exactly what he did. Some of you are way too young to get this reference, and I know that, but some of you are old enough to remember when on TV there used to be a detective called Columbo. And Columbo was this kind of short, rumpled detective. You know, he always had an overcoat on, even if it was summertime. And he was always kind of, you know, dirty and messy. And it, 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 it looked like he was just completely uh, overwhelmed with whatever he was doing. And he spent the whole show acting like he didn't know who the real murderer was. Because it was always, a, you know, a solve a, mur mis a murder mystery show. But Columbo would finally find the killer and he would ask a bunch of questions and, and engage in conversation and he would make the person think that he didn't have a clue what was going on. And so Columbo would ask some question. He'd finally act like, well, okay, I, I, guess, I guess, you know, you're not the killer. I guess you're not the one. And he'd walk away and he'd say, oh, one more thing. One more thing. While I'm at it and on the subject, let me ask you this. And it was that question that unlocked the whole mystery. And it changed everything, and Columbo found the guilty party who was arrested and prosecuted. Not that I want to compare Jesus to Peter Falk or Columbo. But I can imagine Jesus answering this question by saying, All right, it's Caesar's money. It's Caesar's image on the money and his inscription on the money. He made it, he put it out to you, he gave it to you. He wants it back. Give him what belongs to him. Oh, and one more thing. One more thing while you're at it. That which belongs to God, give to God. While you're giving back to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, don't forget to give to God that which belongs to God. There are true, two basic truths in this scripture, if you're taking notes with your outline in the bulletin, there are two basic truths. Truth number one is this, that which bears Caesar's image belongs to Caesar. But number two is even more important. That which bears God's image belongs to God. Now, brothers and sisters, I ask this question. What belongs to God? Well, Whatever bears God's image rightfully belongs to God. What bears God's image? What carries God's image in today's world? Let's go way back in the Bible. Let's go back in the Old Testament to the first page of the book of Genesis. First page of the Old Testament. Genesis chapter 1 verse 27 in the creation story itself, when God created all that is, he created in six days, he rested on the Sabbath, the seventh day, but on that sixth day, when he created human beings, according to Genesis 1.27, so God created man in his own image. 
In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. What bears God's image? Well, we do. I do. You do. You and I are created by God in God's image. We bear the image of God. Not in the sense that we physically look like God because God doesn't have a physical body in the sense that we can paint a portrait of him. But we get, bear God's image because God created us to be relational beings. We carry God's ability to relate. We carry God's attributes and emotions. We are made in God's image. God has stamped us with his image. And because of that, because of the fact that we bear God's image, we rightfully belong to him. And brothers and sisters, that's the whole story. That's the entire truth of existence. Jesus, in this moment of challenge, managed to, yes, answer the question, but uses an opportunity to bring up the most important eternal reality in human history, that you and I and humanity, we are made in God's image. Now you may say, well, preacher, that's great. What does that mean? What does it mean to us? Well, first of all, because we bear God's image, we are of infinite value to God. Because we bear God's image, we are of infinite value to God. You see, in Bible times, when something of value belonged to someone, they would put their inscription on it. If something belonged to someone, they would find a way to either draw or carve or chisel their image on it or draw or carve or chisel some sort of mark that represented who they were. If something of value was in your possession, you marked it so that everyone knew it belonged to you, such as the coins that Caesar marked. People marked things back then, and biblical archaeology will, will constantly come up with ruins that are found in the, in the Middle East, and they'll, they'll show household items or, or things that were used over 2,000 years ago, but they'll have some sort of inscription or mark on it to show that it belonged to a particular owner. Now, people in Jesus' day, the vast majority of people, not just simply in the Middle East, but throughout the world, the vast majority of the people couldn't read or write. So they tried to draw their image on something or have someone who had a gift in that draw the image or sometimes just make some sort of peculiar mark, maybe a fancy X that just simply said, this is, this is mine. Through the years, that's continued throughout human history. Even today, you know, go into a library and most libraries are, have their books stamped in the front with some sort of image and inscription that says property of a local library. Or out west, and I don't know that they, the cattle owners still do this, but I know at one time, cattle owners, in order to identify the cattle that belonged to them, would brand them. There'd be some sort of brand. Each ranch had a particular brand that was easily recognizable. And cattlemen would brand the cattle so that if the cattle got loose and went somewhere, they'd say, see, that, ca that cattle's bearing my mark, my inscription of my ranch. It belongs to me. I guess they still do that. I don't know. But it's come down through us for 2,000 years. And even today, if something belongs to us, oftentimes we write our name on it. And if we're tapping into our funds and our checking account, we have to sign it, don't we? To claim that it's ours. Or if we're making an agreement, we have to sign it, don't we? In order to say, it's my word. You see, we put our image, our likeness, our inscription on things that are of value to us. And the reality is, brothers and sisters, that you and I are created in God's image because we are of ultimate 
infinite value to God. The words of John 3.16 are not just simply charming words that come to us from the pages of a Sunday school lesson or a VBS song. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God's love for us is infinite. Zig Ziglar, famous salesperson and, and Christian motivational speaker who died a few years ago, used to tell the story about a, an evangelist, a traveling evangelist who was quite famous in his day back in the 1800s. This evangelist came to a little town in Newport, Tennessee. Local pastor had invited him to speak and hold a revival at his church. And so this famous evangelist came, and as he was there in town, the pastor was taking him around to meet people. And crowds were forming because they had heard of this noted evangelist. Even kids were showing up, and there were a crowd of kids that showed up and were on the edge of the, of the crowd, and the evangelist said, Bring those kids up. And he started going through the kids. He said, now, who's your father? And the child would say something. Who's your father? Who's your father? Finally, he pointed to one little boy. And he said, who's your father? Now, this little boy obviously didn't have much. Third or fourth hand clothes and rags and dirty. And when he asked this little boy, who's your father? The little boy just stood there couldn't say anything some of the kids started giggling and the pastor who was there with the evangelist said sir you need to know something that's little Ben Hooper little Ben Hooper's mother is not of the best reputation in town as a result little Ben Hooper doesn't have a clue who his daddy is and so as the crowd sort of murmured and kids started laughing and the boy was just standing there obviously in shell shock the evangelist said son I'm sorry I shouldn't have asked you that question he said I should have recognized you right off the bat I know exactly who your daddy is because you look just like him your daddy is your heavenly father you look just like him he's made sure of it so he's got great expectations for you now son don't let him down and you go live for your daddy Over 20 years later, a reporter asked Ben Hooper, standing on the steps of the Tennessee Capitol, if this was the greatest day in his life. And Governor Ben Hooper of the state of Tennessee said, no. The greatest day of my life was when someone told me who my father was. We've got a lot of Ben Hoopers in this world. We have a lot of folks who need to know that they have a father. No, not just an earthly father. A heavenly father who loves them so much that they were created on purpose and they were created in his image and stamped with that image so that they and the world can know they were always of infinite value. And if you're here today and you wonder about your own personal value, if you wonder why you were created at all if you wonder based on the life you've lived if it's been worth it if you wonder if anything can come of your life if you have felt like people have trounced on you or made fun of you or disregarded you and you wonder if you are any value of all I am here to tell you that you are of infinite value to the one to whom it matters most because you bear God's image but now Having said that, let's make sure we get the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey used to say. If you don't remember Paul Harvey, forget it, I'm an old man. You see, because we bear God's image, yes, we're of infinite value to God, but because we bear God's image, he rightly has a claim on our lives. You see, that which bears God's image belongs to God, and that means that you and I belong to him. Here's the reality. When you go into a store and you've got some sort of coupon and you're saying, hey, I want to redeem this. This is my deal. I get, a, I, I get a deal on this product. I'm here to redeem this. 
then you purchase that particular item for what you're entitled to because that coupon belongs to you and you are going to claim it and make it a reality. And let me tell you something. When the God who created you and stamped you with his image and called you of infinite value and worth to him and loved you with a love beyond the ability of anybody in this world to love, when that God did that, that God saw you at your worst and gave you his very best. Apostle Paul says in the book of Romans, it was while we were yet sinners that Christ died for us. In anticipation of the times that we were going to mess up and try to live life our own way and be our own God or let something, something else or someone else be our own God and mess up and, and foul up royally and sin, rebel against God's rules. It was in anticipation of that 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 Jesus who taught in that temple a few days later hung on a cross and died. It's called redemption. It's where we get that word. It's redemption. God said, I have a claim to these people. These people have rebelled against me. They've gone their own way. But you know something? I made them. I created them. I stamped them. They belong to me, and I'm buying them back. And Jesus, his own son, the perfect one, died on the cross in the place of you and me to buy us back. You know why? Because God looked at you at your worst and said, you're mine. You're mine. I've created you. I have loved you. And I'm buying you back from wherever you've been or whatever you've done. Because I've got a purpose and a plan for you. And I'm here to tell you, brothers and sisters, that no matter what you go through in life, no matter what challenge you face, no matter what crisis comes your way, the first step in dealing with it is to give yourself to God. Give yourself to God through faith in His Son, Jesus Christ. I know pastors who will say, if you've got a problem, the first thing you need to do is give the problem to God. Now, I'll buy that up to a point, but I, wanna, I just want to quibble with one little thing. Before you give that problem to God, give yourself to God. Give yourself to God. That just may take care of a majority of the problem. J.T. Seaman's a great missionary who taught missions when I was at Asbury Seminary. Said that there are too many people in this world who have invited Christ into their heart and the Holy Spirit has come in them, but the Holy Spirit is resident. He's supposed to be president. And too many times in our lives, we let God come into our lives and he's a resident, but he's not president. Now, I'm not here to tell you that whatever crisis you're facing or challenge you're facing or situation you're facing, I'm not here to tell you that it's instantly going to go away if you'll give your life to Jesus Christ today. Or, if you're already a Christian, if you give the entirety of your life. Again, what we call sanctification, full surrender to God through Christ. I'm not saying that if you do that, if you take that step of faith today, that everything will instantly get better, but I'll tell you what, it'll start. Because it starts with full surrender to God. Why? Because Jesus said, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. I'm going to invite you now in these moments to bow your heads. Will you just bow your heads and close your eyes for a moment? Normally, I'd, I'd have the keyboardist come, and I'd have the keyboardist play and invite you here to an altar. We have a different circumstance this morning, but I think this will be all right. This is what I want you to do. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Nobody's business but your own and God's. This is what I'm going to say. If this morning, if this morning you realize that you are of infinite value to God, so much so that he gave his son to buy you back, and you want to, you want to make a commitment to Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord this morning, I'm going to simply ask you to do this. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. Not, not for anybody to see, but you and God. If you want to make that commitment, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand right now. Just raise your hand. Amen. And if you are already a follower of Christ, but you realize that there's some things in your life that you have not opened up to him yet, that he may be resident but not president, 
and you want to begin to finally tackle those things that need to be tackled. But you know, it has to begin not with giving God the problem, but giving God yourself completely, fully, and then letting him tackle the problem. If that's where you are and you want to make that commitment today in faith, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Oh, amen. Let's pray together. Lord God, for those who want to accept you in faith, I ask that you simply let them pray this prayer. And they can pray it with me if they want. They can pray in their own words. But Lord Jesus, I know you are who you say you are. You're, you're the Son of God and you're the Savior. I accept you as my Savior and Lord in faith. I repent of my sin. I'm sorry for what I've done. I want to change, and I want to follow you. And if you're opening up parts of your life so God can be fully and totally in charge, then I hope you'll pray this prayer or something like it. You can pray it with me if you want. Lord Jesus, my life is like a house, and I've let you in some rooms, but there's some rooms and some closets I've kept shut. I want you to come into every part of my life so that you can start to work on every problem in my life and help me do the things that I can't do on my own. Lord God, for all those who prayed that prayer, I pray that your Holy Spirit will come upon them and empower them to live out the reality of their commitments and their prayers. And if anyone want anyone to stay after this service, Lord, I pray that you'll inspire them and enable them to, to stay because I'll stay and I know a lot of our leaders will stay and pray with them and talk with them as long as it takes. And as we go forth into your world, help us to be your people. Help us to remember our value. And help us to remember to whom we belong. For we belong to you thanks to Jesus Christ. In whose name and by whose spirit we have gathered and we now go. And let all God's people say, Amen. Amen. God bless you. See you next Sunday.